Good morning. Good morning. Uh, morning. I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, title for the meditation, My Happy Home, after hearing the story of Daniel. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it shows you how hard it is to actually build a happy home in some of the environments in which we uh, live. Um, my name is David, I'm a music director here, and I have other jobs as well. My profession is professor of singing. In that capacity, I work daily throughout this community uh, and at uh, the University of Vermont, at festivals, here in town and in this country and abroad, with many, many singers who, have, who are at very different levels. This past semester uh, at UVM, for example, uh, the enrollment in my private studio and choirs uh, were 92 singers. Add another 18 singers to uh, the group of students who were teaching, taking the course on how to teach singing, uh, voice pedagogy, another 32 singers in my community choir, the Aurora Chamber Singers, the blessed 34 singers of this sanctuary choir here <laughs> okay. at uh, 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 and that's about 175 singers last semester alone that I was working with. Over the years, of course, I've had connection to several thousands of people that I am privileged to call uh, my uh, uh, cohorts. My job, what a blessing it is, is to get people to find, develop, and use their singing voices to serve the artistic goals of great composers to recall the life work of other people. So for example, the intellect of Mozart, the work of Beethoven, the thoughts and writings of Leonard Bernstein, of Duke Ellington cannot come to us today in this place unless there are people who can connect from what it is that those great composers put down on paper and through their own technical expertise bring it into the, this arena. A lot of what I teach is merely technical. Stand up straight. <laughs> Assume an ideal posture for our singing so that the body can do its work with the least amount of interference. Remember the singer's smile. You smile because you're singing, not because you're happy. <laughs> Some of it is about music itself. Faster, slower, louder, softer. But the very first thing at the, at the foundation uh, of my teaching is to remind singers that the actual instrument they are playing is the heart of the listener. And that everything they do in their technical work and in their intellectual or artistic work is about awakening in the heart of the listener the kind of emotional response that was in the mind of the composer. And of course, a whole bunch of other nonsense. <laughs> In the hymn we sang right before the Word of God for All Ages, one of the texts, Then let our songs abound, and every tear be dry. We're traveling through a manual's ground to greater worlds on high. These words, the last verse of hymn 379 that we just sang, were composed by the great, perhaps the greatest, and certainly among the most prolific, uh, and influential hymn writers of the post-Reformation era, Isaac Watts. His name is all over English language hymnals. There are over a dozen hymns by Isaac Watts in the New Century Hymnal, uh, over 20 hymns by Isaac Watts in the Pilgrim Hymnal. He was an uh, English Christian minister. He was a uh, congregationalist, therefore shunned by the Anglicans, shunned by the Presbyterians, couldn't go to Oxford, couldn't go to Cambridge, uh, and yet he became a preeminent hymn writer, theologian, and uh, writer about logic. He wrote over 750 hymns, and is sometimes called the godfather of English hymnody. He was also a poet, and approached his hymn writing from the perspective of a poet, and wrote the following poem, which I find very, very beautiful. It was not ever set as a hymn. Uh, it is effectively his writing about how we as animals lack everything that God does not provide our spirit. And that it is through the association, the reciprocal relationship we have with God 
that we attain our unique standing as human beings, able to reason, and if with reason we approach it, we can reason the existence of God. Let others boast, this is from Our Frail Bodies and God, Our Preserver. That is the title of the poem. Let others boast how strong they be, nor death nor danger fear, but will confess, O Lord, to thee what feeble things we are. Fresh as the grass our bodies stand and flourish, bright and gay, a blasting wind sweeps o'er the land and fades the grass away. But tis our God supports our frame, the God that built us first. Salvation to the almighty name that reared us from the dust. Our lives contain a thousand springs and die if one be gone. Strange that a harp of thousand strings should keep in tune so long. Poetry. Wow. Anyhow, back to Watts hymn 379 for a moment. The source of much of this text, and certainly the inspiration for it, was the biblical book, The Psalms of David. That lyrical, evocative, biblical book that serves as a cushion between the Old Testament and the New Testament. A short word about the Psalms, they were probably not written by King David. Like the origins and constellation of the Bible itself, it is difficult to know precisely which Psalms were written, when, and by whom. And in some respects it doesn't matter, for it is a primordial cry from the history of humanity, gelled in these words that bring us the Psalms. In later Jewish and Christian tradition, the Psalms have come to be used as prayers, either individual or communal, as traditional expressions of religious feeling. Most Psalms are focused on the expression of human feeling, reciprocal to some occasion, an event, or the person of God. They express decidedly human feelings. From Psalm 48, for example, the rulers assembled. They were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them. Pains as of a woman in labor, as when an east wind shatters the ships of Tarshish. That was a description of the feelings of rulers when they saw the glory of God's holy Mount Zion. Not a particular event, but a rather an archetype. The people's reaction differed. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice. Walk about Zion, count its towers, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. Great is God, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. We need to know that although we are confounded by rulers who tremble and act irrationally, God is forever, and that faith in God's triumph is our salvation. Not like things like that ever really happen in the world. <laughs> Words from the Psalms are held in the ancient writings of the Jews, the more modern New Testament, and they appear in snippets in the Quran. They have been included and widely quoted in nearly every bleak transitional time throughout our history. That pivotal spot in the Bible that joins the New Testament and the Old Testament, the scrolls of our heritage, perhaps we could even call this spot the spot between the rock of Peter and the hard place of the Old Testament. That spot between the rock and the hard place, the Psalms, is adorned and embellished with a richness of spiritual imagery that must surely be like an oasis for those who have not yet reached the ramparts of the citadel of the new Jerusalem, the psalmist's image of the happy home in eternity we all aspire to. The psalms at their best respond to our deepest emotions, our elemental fears and our needs. They respond 
to the empty feeling of desperation that accompanies us when we feel we have not done the right thing. They respond by providing a compendium of evocative language and imagery that helps us contextualize our daily journeys and our life journey. They make us say words that define and describe the greatness of God, the steadfastness of God's love that is like bedrock from which we spring forth daily with renewed energy and sometimes in foolishness. Then they make it possible for us to articulate words of forgiveness and words of healing. They remind us of the shortness of our days on earth and the joyful connection to the eternal home. Singing is an art form. Art, I say to my students, is taking something that anybody can do, could do, and doing it. So for, here's a really great example of art. Uh, the art of being a professional catcher on a baseball team. Someone throws an object directly at you going 90 miles an hour. And your instinctive reaction is... <laughs> but the artist, the catcher, will do this. And we hope save the day. That is effectively what art is. Any one of us can probably walk a relatively straight line. Can we do it in front of an audience of 2,000 people, strung on a string 90 feet above the surface? That is art. It's a combination of what we can do physically, what we can imagine, and what through technique we can achieve. Think of the art of singing as the apotheosis of the baby's cry. A baby is born, a baby gurgles, a baby murmurs, a baby sobs. The baby isn't saying, I want to go to the bathroom. The baby is not saying, do you love me? The baby is not saying, I love you. The baby is making a sound which draws every ear for neighborhoods <laughs> to a sound trying to figure out, inviting people to assess what the problem could be. Great singing retains all of the vocal qualities of that that draw the listener's ear the same way the baby's cry draws the listener's ear. But through art, it combines that sound with expressive melody and meaningful words. Great singing stirs our emotion and excites our intellect. It's why we love to hear wonderful voices. All the crummy stuff babies wailing in the middle of the night bring to us or the baby who is screaming in the airplane next to you all the time is combined with the greatest intellectual achievements of all those other people sitting around you and come together that produce a magnificence that must parallel the experience of feeling the breath of God on the top of Mount Zion. The second verse of hymn 379 reads, Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But we our thanks and praise will bring for love so deep and broad. Hymn singing is one of the great social activities. Breathing in unison with other people in a room. The predictable regularity of the cadences of the language, the melody, lofty words that excite the mind and recall connections in our lives to people gone, to times gone, hopeful words of bravery that help us dedicate ourselves new each day to the happiness and the health of generations to come. Singing an eternal song that connects everyone in the sanctuary, making the many me's into an extravagant we. Praising the very bedrock of our joy, our sorrow, and our hopes with hearts and souls and minds and lungs and voices soaring to the vaulted temple in the happy home 
we have made for ourselves the house of God. To paraphrase the words of the poet Friedrich Rickert, I am dead to the world's tumult and noise and rest in a quiet realm. I live solely in my heaven, in my love, and in my song. Hymn 561 uses the following text. When in our music God is glorified, it is as though the whole creation cried, Alleluia. 